Welcome to Home Ties, a podcast about staying connected to home, no matter where you are. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are not necessarily those of the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. Americans have strong opinions about politics. That's evident in wake of the most recent presidential elections. A record 145 million people turned out to cast their ballots. In the United States Constitution, the First Amendment guarantees Americans the right to express their opinions freely, whether it's in print or online, or even to assemble in a public protest. That's not true everywhere in the world. Many countries, the dictators limit people's access to information. They repress voters. They shut down the internet. But on January 6th, 2021, a line was crossed. A mob of angry protesters stormed the U.S. Capitol with the intent of overturning the results of a lawful election and perhaps also killing some members of Congress. And as a result of those events, five people died. Thankfully, it wasn't more. Somewhere, a line was crossed from enthusiasm to fanaticism. Well, foreign mission work calls for enthusiasm. You've got to be all in. There's no halfway serving the Lord. There's no halfway of selling your house and your cars and your furniture and packing up and moving your family half a world away. There's no going back to the life that you've left. When you take a call as a missionary, you leave behind a ministry in the United States, and your congregation or a group of people you were serving, they they move on. They get another pastor. There's no going back to them six months later and begging them to take you back. And when you arrive in your new host country, very quickly you realize that you don't fit in. People may assign false motives to your decision to arrive. They may assume that you are coming because you uh, want to live a fancy expat lifestyle or uh, because uh, you're looking for an adventure. You're misunderstood. You are laughed at or viewed as strange or rejected, or you may even experience outright hostility. And as you carry on your mission work, you see very slow growth. Progress is incremental. There's backsliding. Things can blow up at an instant's notice. And your family back home keeps asking you, when are you coming back? Or even if they don't, you see that your parents are getting older and weaker, and you wonder if you're doing the right thing by them. You can see how there are many challenges to uh, enthusiasm in serving in a foreign mission. How do you keep that level of enthusiasm that you had when you first arrived? The the way that most people uh, react to those feelings is to get busy doing something. Right? You need to justify all these sacrifices that you've made. Now, sometimes it is literally busy work, right? Standing in line all day at the local immigration office uh, or, or at the Department of Motor Vehicles to fill out paperwork. 
or you spend a whole week running around, putting out fires, responding to requests for help that come your way, right? And how can you say no? Isn't that why you came in order to help people? It's easy to get discouraged. It's easy to lash out at the people that are there in your host country, right? You very easily can point out their foibles and weaknesses and contradictions in their culture. You can complain about how slowly things move or how backward things seem to you. You can compare things constantly to the way it's done in your home culture. And, and really, these are all just coping mechanisms that you use to help you deal with these feelings of inadequacy and alienation. Because face it, you're in the minority. When I lived in northwestern Bulgaria, and our family was the only American family living in the entire city. And as far as uh, our religion went, the small number of converts we had, again, small minority. If you're not careful, you can carry a chip around on your shoulder. If anybody questions why you've come, or if they tell you to go home, either subtly or not so subtly, you may react poorly. You may lash out in anger. How dare you question my enthusiasm, my commitment to this mission? And if your local partners don't seem as enthusiastic about the mission as you are, well, consider this. They haven't had to make as many sacrifices as you have. It's their home, right? And even if their religion is in the minority, they can still pass. Nobody's going to point them out in a crowd on the basis of their skin color or the way they talk. And so you, you strive to remain committed. You strive to be enthusiastic about the work you've been sent to do. But because of the sacrifices you've made, because of the position that you find yourself in as a minority, your enthusiasm can very easily cross over into what I would call fanaticism. Uh, sometimes missionaries engage in behavior that uh, might be classified as risky, right? especially as it involves travel, whether you're traveling within your host country or traveling to another part of the world, another country. Uh, you may expose yourself to disease, drinking some water uh, from a local source or eating some food which may not be properly cooked because, again, you don't want to uh, come across as being different. You may neglect some nagging health issues because, well, the people that you work with don't attend to those matters, so why should you? And if you've been living in a foreign culture for an extended period of time, it's possible that you might even somehow begin to forget that you are not from those parts. Uh, it's a huge error to try to interact with people as if you are from their home culture, right? When it comes to managing conflicts, uh, big mistake to take people on and argue with them as if you were from their own culture, to argue with people the way you hear people arguing with each other or anything having to deal with money, right? Again, if you forget that you are a foreigner, um, there's going to be big problems because when people see you, they understand that you are wealthier than they are. It never goes away. Now, sometimes the people who are in, responsible for managing uh, the, the mission may have to make some difficult decisions. Uh, about the allocation of, of the resources, which finally are limited. And I've seen how missionaries can let their zeal for their mission lead them into angry arguments over whose mission is the most important. Now, it's true that in history, some missionaries have been assaulted, kidnapped, even killed. It is a price of being a follower 
of Christ. Now, he did promise that whoever loses his life will find it. But Jesus never commanded us to seek out martyrdom. I don't see anywhere in the Bible where Jesus tells us that we need to throw ourselves into danger on purpose. I guess the question is, when does the mission become more important than the message? 2,000 years ago, Jesus' followers were a minority of the total number of Jews in living in Israel. Those first followers of Jesus were not respected by the authorities. And you think about it, Jesus had a reputation for associating with tax collectors and prostitutes. A man named Nicodemus, who was a respected member of the local Sanhedrin, the ruling body of the Jews, visited Jesus in secret at nighttime because he was afraid what his colleagues might do to him. What better affirmation could there have been for a follower of Christ than to have him pay you a personal visit? Zacchaeus, the tax collector, received Jesus as a guest in his home, as did Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Now, we all know people like Martha, uh, people who have this attitude, you do a job right or don't do it at all. People who pay strict attention to detail, they're go-getters, proactive, busy people who get things done. Martha was zealous to serve the Lord and his hungry dozen followers a tasty meal. But somewhere, Martha's enthusiasm crossed over into fanaticism. Well, I think this happens when you fixate on yourself. When you fixate on the sacrifices that you're making and the hard work that you're doing. When you fixate on the fact that others don't seem to be into it like you are. Can you hear Martha having this conversation in her own head? Here I am, slaving in the kitchen all by myself, and my sister is sitting on her rear end. Now, Martha didn't commit a sin by working in the kitchen instead of sitting at Jesus' feet. The meal wasn't going to cook itself, but the Bible says that Martha was distracted. And the Greek language, the idea is she was pulled away by her zeal to make a great meal for Jesus. And certainly it wouldn't have hurt her own standing in his eyes either. Martha's attention was drawn away from what Jesus had to offer her by all the work that she was doing. I mean, you just think about, what would that have been like to have the Word of God made flesh sitting in your own living room? You could ask him any question you had about anything. Well, when Martha finally blew her stack and came to Jesus and demanded that he tell her sister Mary to give her a hand in the kitchen, the Lord answered, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things. But few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Can you remember more than one or two meals in your lifetime that really stand out? Food is eaten, and then we forget about it. But Christ's words will stand forever. A meal can feed your body for a day. But it can't keep you from dying. Christ's words feed your soul and give you life everlasting. Nobody remembers what Martha served the disciples that day. But here we are, 2,000 years later, still talking about Mary's zeal for Jesus' message. I realize that I am pulled away, that I am distracted by my work because I do have a tendency to turn my work into an idol. 
And I realize that by making an idol out of my work, I'm really idolizing myself. Because the more I get done, the better I look to myself at least. And of course, whenever I end up doing things for my wife or my fellow Malawian Christians that don't benefit me directly or don't elevate my status, it can make me feel like I'm wasting my time. Now, why should I think I'm better than my co-workers or my wife or my colleagues in the ministry? Why should I think that my work is more important than Christ's? You know, Jesus is true God. And yet, in spite of all the, the important work he had to do in heaven, he emptied himself of all his power and glory, and he put my need for salvation ahead of his own life. Without Christ, all of this running around on earth is pointless. I am distracted. I am drawn away from Christ when I fixate on my own activity and not on Christ. He said, it's finished. The sacrifice is made. The redemption is won. And there's nothing I can add to it. So whenever I open the Bible, Jesus is there, right in my own living room. I need to focus on him and not focus on the sacrifices I've made or the feelings I have that I don't belong or the lack of zeal that I observe sometimes in my co-workers or my family. And I need to focus on Christ and the hardships that he overcame to win my eternal salvation and not fixate on the hardships that I experience living in a developing country. I don't need the recognition of my denomination. I don't need to see numerical success. I don't need to receive praise and accolades from my national partners. Nobody, nobody's going to remember any of these things anyway. But the one thing that is needed to know Christ and to be his child will never be taken away from me. Next time on Home Ties, I have a pretty comfortable life here in Malawi. I don't live in a mud hut. I don't cook over an open fire. I don't walk two kilometers to fetch water from a well. But I have been to villages in rural parts of the country. I have been inside the homes of people who do live like that. And I have to deal with the guilt. We'll see you next time.